Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started then. I'm uh, Rex Buchanan, former director of the Kansas Geological Survey, and, and this is uh, the, a webinar from the Regional Induced Seismicity Cons Consortium, headquartered at the Bureau of Economic Geology at uh, Texas, Austin. And ordinarily, these uh, webinars as part of this uh, risk series have been hosted by Michael Young, but uh, today I'm uh, stepping in for Michael, put together uh, a panel of uh, regulators who deal with induced seismicity issues. And we'll talk about the panel and various other folks here in just a minute. I want to begin just by welcoming everybody aboard. And I want to thank all the folks that helped put this uh, together, particularly Dina Miller, who you've heard from here already. Okay, I just got put on mute. This is really uh, the first time that we have put together one of these panels. It's also the first time that uh, we're making this available both on uh, via Zoom and on YouTube. So the folks at UT Austin have, have uh, done yeoman's work in exploring new ways of making these available. So I appreciate all that help from, from everyone. Those of you that are not familiar with the, uh, with the consortium, it was uh, put together to improve the way that state surveys in the Southern Midcontinent could work together to solve the issue and work on the issue of induced seismicity and, and uh, basically use similar approaches and, and uh, to, to approach the, the problem and begin conversations about it. Uh, the, the consortium also works to communicate uh, complex technical issues to a variety of stakeholders, everyone from regulators to industry to academics to the general public. And so uh, this uh, panel today is really an attempt to reach almost all of those audiences with the discussion of uh, regulation of induced seismicity. Uh, this seminar series has been going on for several years, but it's always been before consisted of, of one speaker. And we're gonna try something different here today, which is a panel uh, and an attempt to really try something a little different and also bring perspective of uh, various states from the Midcon to this process. Uh, as Dina mentioned, this is being recorded and it's going to be posted on the RISC website and will be available for several days after that. I finally want to thank the sponsors, the Groundwater Protection Council, Department of Energy, NETL, and the funding was originally routed through the DOE Fossil Energy Office. So with uh, some of those preliminaries out of the way, the logistics for uh, this afternoon, we will uh, begin with about five minutes from each of our four speakers. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves when the time comes. And each of them will get about five minutes to talk about what's going on in their particular state, their, their perspective and their thoughts. Then after that five minute period, we'll go to question and answers and conversation. Now, uh, probably I will start off with a few questions, but if you have questions, you can submit them either via the chat function on uh, Zoom, which I assume that, that everybody is familiar with at this point, or you can submit them through uh, YouTube as well. So you've got two ways of going about that. Michael will be uh, monitoring uh, both of those chats and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have those questions at that time. So there should be plenty of opportunity to uh, to raise the questions, issues that you want to uh, want to discuss once the individual participants go through uh, their period. So with that, I think that sort of outlines what we're gonna do. We will end at three o'clock. So this is strictly an hour. So uh, that's one of the reasons I wanna stay in time as much as possible, stay on time as much as, as possible in this process. So, and with that, the order that we're going to go with here today is uh, we'll start in in, uh, in Oklahoma, in part because Oklahoma, in my mind, was one of the first places where I heard a lot about this process. Then we'll go to Texas, New Mexico, then come back up to Kansas. And at that point, we should uh, be ready to open it up for more questions and conversation. So with that, again, I appreciate all of you tuning in. I appreciate especially the panelists agreeing to do this today. I would like to keep this fairly informal. So as you hear them talk, be thinking of your questions and put them in those chat functions the way that I've been talking about. With that, we'll begin with Colin Brooks from the uh, Oklahoma Corporation Commission. So Colin, if you are ready, 
uh, we will turn it over to you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Let me share my screen right here. Can everyone see my screen? All right. Yep. Yes, we can. All right. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, as Rex stated, my name is Colin Brooks. I work for the Oklahoma Corporation Commission uh, in the Induced Seismicity Department. And today I'll briefly talk about the rise in earthquakes across Oklahoma um, and the regulatory response of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission is taken to address and reduce the seismic hazards for all Oklahomans. Um, the OCC in the state of Oklahoma have had a storied history with induced seismicity, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, on my screen, you'll see an Esri story map presentation of induced seismicity in Oklahoma, which details the OCC's mission and regulatory response to earthquakes related to oil and gas exploration and development in Oklahoma. Um, I'll skip over much of the overview and discussion of what constitutes induced seismicity, as I'm sure most of the audience here is familiar with the material. Uh, but for Oklahoma's particular setting, one must understand three things. One, Oklahoma does have natural earthquakes, but at very low rates. Um, two, disposal-induced seismicity occurs in Oklahoma largely as a result of injection in deep class two wells scattered across northern and central Oklahoma, uh, predominantly, and that's the predominant uh, induced seismicity activity associated with oil and gas in our state. And then three, hydraulic fracturing is also responsible for induced earthquakes, albeit at a lesser rate and magnitude um, in Oklahoma's active oil and gas blaze, such as the Arcoma and the Anadarko Basin in western and southwestern Oklahoma. Um, so as a context, uh, prior to 2009, the average earthquake rate in Oklahoma was two magnitude 3.0 earthquakes per year. Uh, in 2015, Oklahoma experienced over 900 magnitude 3.0 earthquakes, the majority known to be a result of anthropogenic activities. As a result of this um, significant increase in earthquake activity, the OCC developed and instituted numerous regulations based on scientific research, evidence, and facts. And I'll quickly just ru run over the most important ones. Um, so beginning in March of 2015, the OCC mandated the state's first regulatory rules known as OCC directives to limit disposal into the Arbuckle group and move injection intervals from known seismic hazards present in highly fractured crystal and basement rock below the Arbuckle group up section. As a result of the actions taken by the commission, over 225 Arbuckle group disposal wells have been isolated from basement rock and more than 168 wells have either terminated their UIC disposal authorization or recompleted to uphole zones of lower seismic hazard. Uh, by the end of 2016, more than 21 directives have been issued in the area of interest for disposal seismicity in Oklahoma. Um, and that area encompasses 10.4 million acres and 16,000 square miles. Um, and on my screen, you can see kind of the evolution of that uh, approach of, you know, regional regulation over disposal wells. Um, in response to the largest earthquake reported in Oklahoma, which occurred in September of 2016 in Pawnee, Oklahoma, um, the OCC partnered with the EPA to shut in 32 Arbuckle Group wells and reduce disposal of 35 others in Pawnee and Osage counties. So it was a joint approach. Um, I think that's the first time that's occurred um, in the U.S. Since uh, 2016, 10 additional directives curtailing disposal into the Arbuckle Group have been released uh, for a total of 31 since 2015 to present. The OCC has also responded to hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity with um, a directive first issued in December of 2016. Here you can see a specific area of the Scoop Stack province in Oklahoma. Um, and that hydraulic fracturing protocol uh, specifically mandated a magnitude threshold for regulation during completion operations. Uh, the hydraulic fracturing protocol has been updated once in February of 2018 and currently requires actions by operators beginning at a 2.0 magnitude. Um, as the move away from high water cut plays in northern Oklahoma and the regulatory actions and directives discussed here reduced Arbuckle Group disposal volumes in the area of interest by more than 60% from 2015 to 2020. As the reduction in disposal volumes has taken hold, um, the quick regulatory actions and shut-ins of wells near seismogenic faults has reduced the seismic hazards in Oklahoma. 
briefly, I'll just show that using a, a little earthquake dashboard. Um, and as you can see in this earthquake dashboard, uh, Oklahoma has reduced its magnitude uh, 3.0 events from over 900. Just quickly filter it for you from over 900 in 2015 to by 95% to 2020. And the last magnitude 5.0 earthquake that has occurred in Oklahoma was in November 2016 in Pawnee County near Cushing, Oklahoma. So a brief explanation of Oklahoma seismicity, um, but all of these presentations that I've shown you here today can be found on our website um, at occ.ok.gov. We show you where to find that. So if you go to our divisions on our homepage and go to the oil and gas conservation division and then scroll down to the induced seismicity department and UIC department, you can go and, and view both of these public documents and you can peruse them at your leisure. So I think that's all I have, Rex. Uh, hope I didn't go over too much. You did fine, Colin. Nice job. Way to stay on time. You're a model for other folks. Uh, Thank you. And those of you that are just now joining us, I'm Rex Buchanan, former director of the Kansas Geological Survey and moderating today. And again, uh, your questions can go on uh, the chat function in Zoom or on uh, via YouTube as well. Uh, next up in this process is Sean Abbott from the Texas Railroad Commission. So Sean, I think we're ready for you. Okay, just going to share my screen here. Hopefully you can see that. That's up, yep. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, like Rex said, I'm Sean Abbott, and I'm the Injection Storage Permits Unit Manager at the Railroad Commission of Texas. Although I suspect many of you know this, I'll point out that the Railroad Commission is the oil and gas regulator in the state of Texas and no longer regulates railroads. My unit uh, primarily enforces underground injection control rules for the oil and gas industry. As oil and gas development took off in the Barnett Shale during the mid 2000s, so did the rate of earthquakes. There were several events that were felt by many people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and perhaps most concerning earthquakes began near the DFW airport. Although the operator of a nearby disposal well shut in the well in 2009, a 3.4 magnitude earthquake occurred a few years later. Earthquakes also began near Temson in East Texas, the largest event there was a 4.8 magnitude event that caused some property damage. In response, the commission amended its disposal well rules and the Texas legislature authorized funding to produce TexNet, our seismic monitoring network. The new rules require oil and gas operators to provide a survey of prior seismic events within 100 square miles of a proposed disposal well. The commission also clarified its authority by explicitly stating that the commission may modify, suspend, or terminate a disposal well permit if the well is likely to be contributing to seismic activity. We started tracking regions as we investigate them, assigning them as natural, the bright purple regions, historic, the gold regions, or current. Historic simply means that we are no longer actively investigating the region, typically because seismicity has lessened. I will show a map of the current seismic investigation regions on a later slide. Here you can see some of the regions that we've been talking about. The DFW area has three gold regions and Timson is the gold region east from there. When oil and gas development ramped back up and moved west, especially in the Delaware Basin, so did the seismic reviews required by our new rules. We had one seismologist and one geologist working these applications in 2017. By 2019, with our new seismicity permitting guidelines, we had the entire technical staff performing seismic reviews with only the highest hazard scores requiring um, seismologist review. We had a, a substantial backlog that was eliminated within a matter of months. Several aspects were key to the success. We created a scoring sheet so that our permit reviewers could assess seismic hazard quickly and consistently. We developed GIS tools and procedures to automate as much of the review as possible. That work is ongoing. And we incorporated ind industry and academic feedback of our guidelines early in the process. This is a screen cap that shows what our permit reviewers might be looking at it during a seismic review. We have our script launcher open on the left, accompanied by our UIC database display. Directly in front of those is the mainframe, which has been the commission's data workhorse since the 1980s. And on the right, we have our seismic area of interest tool, which uses ArcMap to display and analyze seismic events with, um, from the USGS and TexNet catalogs, faults, disposal well permit application statuses, and uh, previous seismicity review scores, injection well data, and other information.
In 2018, a 3.6 magnitude earthquake near Timson started an investigation that resulted in modification of one permit to lower volume and pressure um, and cancellation of another disposal well permit. The temporary seismic array deployed near Timson and publications using that data were very helpful for regulatory decision making. While many people in Texas will remember 2020 for COVID-19 or winter storm URI, I will also remember it for the 5.0 magnitude of earthquake outside of Mintone. As an example of the recent change in seismicity, there are 18 seismic events, 4.0 or greater, from 1973 to 2017 in the USGS catalog. There are 12 4.0 uh, or greater events recorded in the TexNet catalog, which began in 2017. Half of them are in this image of Culberson and Reeves counties. We had been tracking the seismicity in Culberson County prior to the 5.0 event and had already requested additional information from operators in the vicinity. Nonetheless, this earthquake required us to quickly formalize our response to seismicity and also to produce new tools to handle daily injection data from disposal wells within the seismic investigation regions. TextNet is also helping us develop tools to handle this uh, injection data. These are the areas that um, we are currently investigating. Um, from west to east, the Mentone or Culverson, um, Reeves County uh, seismic clusters, the Gardendale or Midland Odessa seismic clusters, um, the Stanton seismic cluster just to the northeast of Midland, Odessa, and lastly, the recent seismicity on the border near El Indio in South Texas. And with that, I'll pass it back to Rex. Okay, thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. And again, as you, as you come up with your questions, if you want to uh, aim them toward one specific speaker, make sure that that's clear in your question or either give the name of the speaker or the state that you're directing the questions to. If you want to ask a question of everybody, that's fair game as well. So with that, then we'll go to uh, New Mexico and uh, Philip Getz from the New Mexico Oil Conservation Division. So Philip. Uh, I'm Philip Getz, and I am the manager of our UIC group, and we at this point are handling most of the issues regarding induced seismicity. Uh, historically, New Mexico has not had that many occurrences of induced seismicity. Uh, we've had two previous locations that have been well documented, uh, but of late we have returned to a profile of deeper injection. Uh, we also have occurrences in the Raton Basin, uh, but that still is being considered and reviewed. Uh, currently, we have two locations that are being uh, expanded upon. Uh, one is the Livington, Livingston, outside of Livington, uh, south, and, and we have an area associated with the county line just north of the Texas state line. Uh, Again, these have been very small events, but they have been occurring such that they do warrant our investigation as being related to deep injection. Uh, we are new to this. Uh, we don't have as much background on this, and this is why we've looked to uh, the states like Oklahoma and Texas to provide us with a, a template as to how we're going to address it. Currently, uh, we have interaction with industry has provided us deep seismic information as well as interpretation. And we're working with those folks in cooperation with NGOs, uh, including New Mexico Tech, where the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources has a uh, function with its uh, seismological observatory. Uh, to that end, uh, that has now been staffed as well as our group, and we are increasing our GIS usage, and we are also increasing the database by introducing new requirements for seismic uh, monitoring stations so that we can increase our network. Uh, we currently uh, do not have a, uh, a system in which we can uh, actually reach out and coordinate and make direct uh, recommendations. This is something that we're working on. Uh, we have had success in dealing with one source, uh, location in that we have identified a source that we're going to have to go back in and plug back. Uh, 
our biggest concern is that we now have had the presence of what we consider a much larger operator in the sense of midstream companies. Uh, prior to this time, most of our oil and gas operators had their own systems and usually we had small companies. Uh, the introduction of the large midstream along with pipeline systems has created a much greater network of permitting as well as monitoring that we are trying to address through spacing and as well as requirements for the uh, assessment for induced seismicity using one of the models, preferably the Stanford model, and including that in our permitting side. Uh, on the other side of it, the operational side, uh, we are compiling information on injection rates as well as capacities and looking at the potential for finding preferred areas and in a sense manage our disposal for our deep injection zones. Um, and at that point, I'll, I'll say that's it for us. Okay, Philip, thank you. And uh, finally, uh, the last of our panelists, Ryan Hoffman from the uh, Kansas Corporation Commission. So Ryan. Well, thank you, Rex, and, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to, to participate in this panel discussion today. Uh, prior to, to talking about our experience, I would like to maybe differentiate myself from some of my co-panelists, and that's that I don't have the science background that they do. I am merely an attorney, not a, a geologist or a engineer. So please keep that in mind when you're asking questions later and save the hard ones for them. Uh, also, having said that, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that everything I say today is my opinion and not that of the Kansas Corporation Commission. I can't talk about in, induced seismicity in Kansas without starting here. Uh, this is the Harper County Courthouse in Anthony, Kansas. Uh, spent more time in this building uh, than I ever thought I would uh, in, in 2014, 2015, because this is really where it started in Kansas. Uh, in late 2013, we had some seismic events and then carrying into 2014, and most of them were along the border there with Oklahoma in Harper and Sumner County, Kansas. Um, at first, our governor formed a task force with the Geological Survey and the Department of Health and Environment and the Corporation Commission and, and sort of tasked us with, with coming up with a response. Uh, what we provided to the governor was that uh, at the time it was clear Kansas needed more seismic monitoring capabilities that uh, we only had two monitors in our state at the time and uh, only one of them functioned as it should. Uh, and then the second major uh, part of that report to the governor was that uh, we developed a formula by which we would decide how to respond to seismic events. And essentially that formula triggered a seismic action score. Uh, we would get together, share data and decide what actions were necessary. Uh, despite all of these great plans, the earthquakes didn't slow down. Uh, this is what uh, South Central Kansas looked like in 2015. Uh, that red star is where that hundred year old courthouse was. So as you can imagine, every time we went there to have a meeting, it was, uh, kind of crossing your fingers and hoping one of those earthquakes wouldn't happen while we were there. Um, but it was also in 2015 in March that the commission used their uh, administrative, uh, or I should say their emergency powers under the Kansas Administrative Procedures Act to issue an order. And what that order did was several things. Uh, first, uh, it identified areas of seismic concern and working with KGS, we determined where uh, the majority of the seismic clusters were happening. And that's the areas within those yellow or, or mustard lines. And then it identified what a, a large volume our bulk disposal well is. And that order said anything that was permitted for more than 5,000 barrels per day. So what you see on this map, all those blue dots are large volume our bulk disposal wells. Uh, the order capped their daily disposal rate at 25,000 barrels per day, unless they were within one of those areas of seismic concern. If they were in, within one of those areas, uh, gradually over time, they had their volume, daily maximum volume reduced to 8,000 barrels per day. And then um, all 23 of those wells also had to verify their true vertical depth. And if they were drilled deeper than uh, the base of the arbuckle, they had to plug back up into uh, the arbuckle. This order was continued. And then uh, in September of 2016, the commission uh, issued a second order. And what that second order did uh, was it maintained what, what the first order did, but then it expanded into these blue boxes, a, a daily disposal limit of 16,000 barrels per day. And uh, that's overlaying on the, the red grid. And that red grid uh, was provided to us from the survey 
as areas, a section township ranges where they had actually uh, a recorded seismicity with their new network. Uh, this order remained in place uh, as it was until September of 2019, at which uh, point, based on staff's recommendation, the commission closed the docket. Um, it found that the emergency conditions no longer existed. There was no need um, to act using emergency powers because there, there just wasn't an emergency anymore. Uh, more importantly, though, before they closed the docket, the commission did designate their prior orders as precedential. So now even though there's no live docket, those conditions remain in force in effect. Um, and I think the question is, you know, did it work? Um, this is what that area looks like now from uh, the beginning of 2019 until last Friday. So what was once uh, on the prior previous slides is, is one year showing 2015, you can see the, the dramatic decrease in seismicity in that area. And I would note that it's not all gone, but I think that that courthouse probably shakes a lot less nowadays than it did back in 2015. Uh, one thing that I would point out too is that we still have pockets of seismicity. And then we also have seismicity in areas where we didn't have it before. Um, so in, in stepping back and, and looking at, you know, statewide uh, since 2015, this is what, you know, the seismicity looks like for Kansas. And I think this is attributable to the increased monitoring. You know, we, we see a lot more now than we ever did before. Uh, but now, you know, in terms of lessons learned and what we would be trying to decipher by looking at this, I think uh, you have to look at each of these areas as a unique area. Uh, and some of these we have historical seismicity, others uh, we have no disposal, uh, others there's you know different classes of wells both using the Arbuckle. So I think uh, my primary lesson learned as a regulator with regard to induced seismicity is I, I think it's it's easy as a human to want to try and, and quantify things and look at them all the same or uniformly. But uh, I think from a regulatory standpoint, you have to focus in on that area and, and determine uh, what specific factors are at play in each of those areas. And with that, uh, I hope I didn't upset your ex and go too long. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ryan. That was good. Actually, I thank all of you for staying on time. I'm used to dealing with academics who uh, five minutes means an hour. Uh, so with that, we'll go to the question and answer uh, section. And I actually, I'm going to use my prerogative for a couple of quick questions and then I'll, uh, Michael, just a heads up, then I'll go to you. Uh, first off, Sean, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned that Texas uses this, a seismicity review score. Did I understand that right? And what does that consist of? Sure, and I, I happen to notice that um, that's basically the same question as uh, one in the chat. And I'm, I'm not surprised that there are more questions about that. Let me see if I can pull up my, presentation uh, real quick and uh, show you something here. Let's see if I can I zoom in enough. Um, so if this is visible, um, is. Yes. you can see that we've got uh, basically three main categories, um, seismicity and faulting factors, operational factors, and reservoir factors. And um, we've given them basically three broad categories of um, uh, score. And, um, and the, the ones that are most important are the seismicity and faulting factors. Um, there's several here relating to, you know, individual earthquakes within some distance or, or a particular count um, within an area. Uh, number of faults and things like that, and and so we we typically focus on on uh, this part of it, um, but that this is basically the the score uh, scoring sheet, and uh, each of the reviewers is is looking at um, this whenever they make their decision, um, and these uh, the result largely is volume. So um, there are some other conditions that we associate with um, with the final overall score. But uh, A, B, and C essentially equate to 30,000 barrels per day, 20,000 barrels per day, and for the highest hazard category, 10,000 barrels per day. And when did you institute that system? Um, we've been doing that since uh, 2019, I think February. Um, yeah. Okay. And is it part of your set up within your rules and reg system or is it a just a policy or how, how have you codified that so it's um 
It is not uh, in our rules. Um, it is a, a it is basically just part of our regular review. The uh, the rules were amended to require a survey of information um, given to us as part of the application. This is sort of us taking that information in uh, along with other geologic information, um, which we sometimes require during, uh, which we do require uh, during the uh, uh, the review of the application. Okay, thank you. I, and I have uh, one quick question for Colin then before we go to you, Michael. Colin, uh, you know, as, as you alluded to, and I think most of us know, Oklahoma has been in this business for a long, long time. Uh, how, one of the clear, there, I mean, the two basic steps that people tend to take here in terms of big disposal volumes is uh, plugging back out of the basement and uh, reduction of uh, volume disposed. Could you give me some sense of how relatively efficacious you think those two things are? That is, how, how, how efficacious has been plugging out of the basement compared to volume reduction? Um, I mean, we took those approaches around the same time. So I think to, like disentangling those two from one another might be impossible, but um, I would say that, um, Obviously, injection into a much higher hazard zone, such as the crystalline basement with its, um, you know, high density of uh, seismogenic faults is a much larger hazard than um, any zone above it that has a much lower um, density of seismogenic faults. So um, that probably had the greatest overall impact, um, you know, going forward over the long term is you know, removing those wells from a much greater seismic hazard uh, injectivity zone. Um, and then, you know, as far as the overall volume reductions, I mean, I think that's had a large impact as well, but, you know, th they, they do go hand in hand, so. And, and I realize it's difficult. There, there are so many variables at play here in terms of, of the things we just talked about, as well as the, the geology and, price of oil that affects production and everything else, trying to tease apart one variable from all the rest of these is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some other questions here, but I think at this point it'd be probably fair to go to some of the chat questions. And, and Michael, I will uh, let you unmute and see which ones of those you want to go to. No, that's, uh, that's great. Thank you, uh, Rex, and to the panelists. And so, you know, this question of, um, I would say administrative controls versus injection controls is one that several folks have, have put in the, in the, in the chat window. And, and so th this is really a question to, to anybody. I mean, we, we know that there are, um, there's a time variability in the amount of water that's being injected. And we know that there's administrative controls on your side that are limiting where water can be injected. And, and maybe to the other panelists, I think Colin, you, you drew the short straw the first time. And I'm just sort of curious as to the others, maybe Sean, uh, Philip, um, uh, how or Ryan, you know, how, how do you see the role of, of sort of regulatory controls versus the cycles of uh, oil and gas operations and water injection contributing to these changes in seismicity? Do you, do you all? Have any thoughts about that? Well, I'll interject and say that this is one of the causes that we're looking at going back into rulemaking. Uh, we've also had a concern about how far we can press practices versus what is in our administrative code. Uh, at this point, the laying the foundation down for being able to exercise a better control or sense of control has been achieved by uh, a rewrite of our UIC permit and including conditions in there such that if there's induced seismicity occurring, we can reach out and have at least the opportunity to work with the operator or uh, restrict or change and modify the uh, application, the, excuse me, the permit so that we can address the conditions. Great, thanks, Ryan. I would echo that. I think that was one of the first things we did was we we went to our permits and made sure that they allowed us the authority to do um, adjustments uh, in relation or in response to induced seismicity. 
And uh, also if we had operators who were wanting to put wells in areas where we had seen seismicity, that was one of the things we would you know, have phone conversations with them ahead of time to let them know that this was something that was going in their permit and it was not negotiable. Um, so. And, uh, and so are you, are you seeing a reduction in injection volumes? And this is probably a question also to Sean uh, at the Railroad Commission. I, I, I would say, yeah, we, we saw a tremendous decrease, but I think a lot of that was also market driven. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so we, we've been uh, reviewing our, um, our guidelines since they've been in process for about uh, uh, two years now. And um, one of the first questions I, I had honestly was, you know, uh, how much, how much volume is out there? How, um, and, and are the volumes that we're, uh, proposing in our seismic guidelines, are they having an impact? Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, what I, what I think we've seen specific to certain formations is, um, the Delaware, um, it seems like the, what we're seeing in the data is we're not getting, uh, necessarily injection volumes that are greater than 30,000 uh, barrels per day on a regular basis. Um, that seems to be pretty uncommon, but deeper disposal wells seem to be able to put away uh, a fair amount more water. And so, um, you know, with respect to uh, the volumes that we have in our guidelines now, I think that um, they can in fact reduce uh, a fair amount. And, that, and, and so for the new permits that we're issuing, those are being restricted, um, but it's kind of hard to measure that because a lot of the, the uh, disposal wells that, um, that, that are out there now, we don't have long histories for them um, to see that sort of change. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, here's a, so, so um, Rex, I'll ask the next, next question. And um, this comes from Ryan Schultz. He put it in the chat box and he asked a number of questions. You all may recall that Ryan was one of our speakers previously. And so um, the question here for the group overall, you know, what are the regulatory thoughts on requirements for industry to monitor seismicity? In other words, private networks. Um, how are your states varying in your approach to, to doing this? And uh, what are the perceptions and reactions to requiring that the data be shared with the broader community? And again, this is for private networks. Who wants to tackle that first? Colin's smiling, I guess he'll, uh, he'll take it first. Um, the OCC doesn't mandate any private networks, um, be employed by oil and gas operators. Um, however, um, in the past we have required as part of our hydraulic fracturing protocol, certain levels of monitoring, uh, be present, uh, in an area that's, you know, where active wells are being completed. Um, but the OGS has been sufficient to keep pace with their monitoring um, across the state for our hydraulic fracturing protocols. Um, and, and largely, you know, disposal induced seismicity in Oklahoma is a fairly high magnitude, um, you know, um, case of induced seismicity and doesn't require a really low, uh, magnitude of completeness from seismic networks. So the public network in Oklahoma is more than sufficient, uh, for all the areas that we have, um, large scale disposal operations and I can't control it. That hurts my... Um, how about uh, Sean? Any thoughts about uh, private networks or uh, even if it's not private, it's just sort of contributing to public networks? Yeah, so, um, you know, when we, when we produced our guidelines, um, a recommendation that actually came from industry was that um, we give incentive to, uh, to put out seismic uh, monitoring and, and to, um, to our our main focus was that we have access to that data in some way, or that um, at least uh, researchers have access to that data. Um, because, you know, we're regulators, we know a lot, but, but the research and uh, the causal associations, all, all that sort of stuff is, is not really our ballywick. And so um, we wanna make sure that the information was out there. So our incentive, um, which is 10,000 barrels per day, on top of the, um, the initial volume uh, seismicity score um, is, is only for a contribution to a public network, um, which in the state of Texas sort of de facto ends up being TexNet. And uh, when TexNet had its initial rollout, you know, um, 
densified the network substantially, but now um, we're getting uh, in some areas where you know, we're getting better depth resolution and, and we hope that that will help uh, answer some questions that we have about this and then ultimately give us uh, uh, more information to make better uh, regulatory decisions. And so um, that was actually a really uh, great part of, of being able to sort of openly discuss what we were doing with um, our guidance and what we were planning was incorporating some of that feedback and some of these ideas that, you know, we would not have come up with ourselves. Great, thank you. Ryan or Philip, do you have those uh, private networks up there? Yes, we do have private networks, um, again, mostly held by the midstreams, but we've gone the approach of uh, the commission has a sign where we have uh, acid gas injection wells that a monitoring, a seismic monitoring station be put in place with that well. And we've also introduced in again, our permitting process, the requirements for a station or group of stations, but then we coordinate with the Bureau, the Mexico Bureau, and uh, hopefully this concept of having a public array to uh, work with uh, the uh, tech, with the catalog, uh, that our hopes that we'll have this uh, in place and won't have to rely on private sources. Thank you. We don't, uh, I guess I should say there are no private networks associated with class two wells. There is a private network associated with class one wells and that data does become public uh, for anything that's magnitude two or greater uh, after six months. And um, prior to that though, we do have uh, monthly meetings with the geological survey where we, we review uh, anything that's going on statewide that they see with either the private network or the public network. Great, thanks. And and so um, I know Rex is uh, is eager to ask his question. I just wonder if there's uh, any thoughts on on the perceptions from these these private network operators uh, whether the data should be shared publicly, could be, certainly should not be. Do you have any just any quick thoughts about that? In in Oklahoma, there are several private arrays that primarily monitor the scoop stack. Um, you know, are active. Uh, hydraulic fracturing region in Oklahoma, um, and none of that data is public. Um, I think there's been a fair amount of reticence about that because it's their business model. Um, you know, they supply service uh, and, and they expect that data to be confidential. So um, there's definitely been uh, discussions about it, but no movement on that in Oklahoma. All right, thank you. Rex, you got a question. Yeah, uh, and this is a question for everybody, and I'll go in the order that I'm sort of seeing you guys up here on, on my screen. What is it, at this point, uh, all, all of these states in the Southern Mid continent got an awful lot of scientific attention once induced seismicity kicked off and were the subject of a lot of attention from all sorts of folks from all sorts of places. What is it today, now that we're several years into this process, what information would you like to have from either academic types or industry, either one that you currently don't have today. We've talked a lot about the things that have worked and monitoring, uh, the, the techniques you all have come up with to deal with this, but in an ideal world, what is it that you would like to have information you would have from either academics or industry that you don't currently have? And Ryan, I'm gonna start with you because you're first up on my screen. That'll give the other folks a little more time to think about that. Well, I, I think in terms of what we would need. I think I mentioned, you know, I think when you look at Kansas, there are a lot of unique pockets where we're having seismicity. And one of the, the things that I think gets thrown out a lot is that, you know, the Arbuckle is such a, a heterogeneous form, formation that um, for me, it, it seems like we can't just take a, a model and, and plug and play and say, this is what's happening here. And that's why I think maybe more information and it maybe not just from the researchers, but maybe from the industry as well, in terms of what the Arbuckle is like in those areas, because some of those wells are really old and we don't have good logs, so we can't tell you what's going on in those areas. So I, that's what I would say. Sean, I'll let you go next. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, just sort of following, I guess, on what Brian is saying, you know, um, data with greater certainty. Um, you know, there's a lot of good 3D seismic out there that we just can't really get our hands on um, and that can't really be shared. Um, and 
and so uh, that would be extremely useful um, if there are you know fault zones, fracture zones that we're not aware of. Um, that would be incredibly useful um, and uh, uh, greater uh, resolution of the the locations of earthquakes, of course, um, which is you know getting better over time for sure. Um, and so it can always be better, though. <laughs> Colin, Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, I would second what Sean said that, um, you know, good quality three seismic data to, you know, further improve fault maps and, and provide that, you know, context for permitting is, is really would be very beneficial. Um, in Oklahoma, I do know that there was a large dump of that sort of industry data, 2D and 3D seismic data that um, was used to inform the OGS's most recent fault, fault maps. Um, I believe they received that in 2014, but there hasn't been anything submitted since then. So perhaps, you know, we could work on getting some more of that outdated information that's not necessarily confidential anymore and work towards um, some sort of an update on, on all of our fault information for Oklahoma. Um, and I think in addition to that, um, definitely having a better understanding of, um, you know, the Arbuckle is, is obviously very important in Oklahoma. Um, we still have, you know, 400 and something active Arbuckle wells in the area of interest for seismicity. So any further research, uh, it, you know, that could be done on that would be very helpful to, you know, us as regulators. Uh, and then also <laughs> after Sean is, is better resolution of the seismic data. I mean, the OGS, uh, receives, you know, public funding to, to support their uh, seismic network in Oklahoma. And that's what we, you know, as the regulator use to inform our decisions. And definitely depth resolution is something very important to help identify, you know, causal mechanisms for earthquakes and uh, anything that can be done to densify the OGS network uh, would be helpful. Thank you. And finally, Philip from New Mexico. Well, we have an ongoing project right now. Uh, since we did a lot more uh, introduction of injection in Devonian, which is more Silurian than Devonian, uh, the effort to take that information and compile it and give it to us as a, as a tool for determining, uh, do we have good separation from the Precambrian? Do we have good uh, placement of the injection zones? Uh, we're all trying to get that information into place so that we can use it as a decision model. Uh, the other thing too is uh, we're always looking at the opportunity for people to second uh, investigation after we've done an action to come back and do a, a final critique of the, uh, the process as well as the data that was acquired. So we're always looking for people from uh, uh, from the academics to take a look and see if there's a better way of doing it. Thank you. You know, for what it's worth, that, that conversation about 3D seismic availability was one that I know we talked about through the Groundwater Protection Council and IOGCC early on and when we were working on that primer, because sharing that data that a lot of times was proprietary, it was really important and yet we never really came up with a good model for a way to do that. And it's interesting that that's still an issue that's hanging out there today. Uh, Michael, I, 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 I see we've still got quite a few more questions to go here, so I'll turn it back over to you. Right, so, uh, uh, so you know, one sort of follow-on um, thought uh, from Scott Tinker was whether the private networks could be used um, to improve depth resolution and depth identification, but without the data itself being shared and made public. And I, I don't know if that is, I'm sure that there are discussions uh, in your states on, on using that. And it, it could go both ways, of course, because your public networks can uh, help the depth resolution of private networks and the data that they're getting is publicly available. So I don't know if, if the data, if that would be, it would go the other way uh, from private to public. But uh, if, is, is anybody able to sort of use that as a, not an incentive, but just as a way of kind of managing risk of uh, disclosure? Well, we have had the situation that if you identify an operator, the tendency is they're willing to share their data to either substantiate 
the position of that they are not the cause or possibly that there's another source. So the opportunity for sharing does come up, but uh, we've not had restrictions to keep it uh, from the public. Yeah, great. Thank you. So let me go, I'll go on to the next question here. Uh, this comes from Peter Hennings, which I think is a really interesting uh, question because it basically focuses on the research that the state surveys can do to support the regulatory community. Um, and so he, his preamble, you know, there are, are cases of saltwater disposal seismicity inducement where the science has implicated long distance inducement. I mean, we've seen this in, in Kansas, for example, Fort Worth Basin. Um, and I guess the question is how can or should seismicity reviews and or permitting and operating guidelines evolve to address these situations? Um, you know, what sort of scientific work should be prioritized to provide the best assistance to, to you all and your regulatory functions? Um, so I will say, you know, this is something that we're grappling with right now, of course. Um, there's uh, been publications that have, um, that have stated that uh, the most likely cause uh, for the earthquakes in around Culverson, Reeves County, are um, up to 25 kilometers away. Um, we have taken that and started to look at uh, uh, earthquakes um, within 25 kilometers of deep disposal wells. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a really difficult question because that, that becomes kind of a, a question of how far is too far um, for you know, essentially a preliminary review um, associated uh, with a, a permit. Um, because if we if we were to take the distances um, between you know some of the wells in Oklahoma and and some of the earthquakes in Kansas, they would be extraordinarily large. It would it would make uh, permitting almost infeasible. Um, and so I, I think that that and how to apply that is is something that we're we're working through right now, frankly. Um, and I don't have an answer for that, but I I it would be great uh, to to get some help in that in that department. Excellent. How about uh, the folks over in Kansas and Oklahoma? I know that there's uh, there's uh, papers that have come out with uh, you know, pressure pulses that have gone for tens of kilometers. I'll, I'll speak. I mean, I don't know that I can add much to what Sean said. I, I think what he said was pretty much, I, I know I don't like to say universal, but I, I would agree with his approach there. I, I would say that in Kansas right now, uh, the governor has formed a study group to, to look into those actual specific things. Um, and we're a member of that, that group and we're, we're studying the Arbuckle in South Central Kansas to determine, I, I would say, what's going on in that area. To, and I think whatever comes out of that study could be beneficial in, in future permitting decisions. Great. Yeah, I think only one one particular case study in Oklahoma, um, you know, has that kind of context of long long distance, uh, you know, fault destabilization via whichever mechanism you know you want to employ for that, um, and that would be uh, in northwestern Oklahoma on the border of Woods County or um, Woodward and Woods County. But um, I mean, it's very hard to discern those types of things in Oklahoma with as many disposal wells as we have and as many seismogenic faults as we have. So, um, you know, to, for a regulator to make permitting uh, restrictions based on that is, is I think, uh, not an accurate science at this point. Yeah, it's very tricky. Um, so here's a very interesting question. Um, and, and this is to any of the panelists who want to answer it. Um, how does your agency deal with permit submissions that may lack certain technical evidence to ensure um, that the lack of evidence doesn't become regarded as a lack of risk? Well, in our process, the ability for administrative approval, uh, it has to be there. Uh, we don't really have much in the way of, of getting out of providing at least at least a, a minimum risk assessment. And if there is a problem or issue with it, then it's sent to hearing and the opportunity for input from various sources as well as commission gives the, uh, the opening for more examination and question that normally wouldn't come out of a piece of paper. 
All right. How, how, about, the, how about the others? Um, so we we include uh, a factor in our seismicity review scores um, for the quality of the data. It's a qualitative factor, um, but uh, you know if somebody is able to share with us uh, seismic data, you know they're demonstrating a, a certain um, resolution of data um, and you know a lack of faulting at that resolution, then that gives us a level of confidence. Um, but I, I think ultimately, um, you know, having as much information in the public domain, requiring a minimum level of information as the regulator um, is is the is the way to go. Um, because there's always going to be somebody who has, you know, better access to something. Well, that's the hope that, right, that we are able to innovate our way toward uh, more complete applications that are you know, still with the appropriate level of information and higher quality data. Great. Rex, um, we are very close to the top of the hour. I mean, there are still a couple of questions here and what we will do for those that were not answered is uh, we'll uh, pull those off the chat box and then we will send uh, the questions to our panelists and try to get uh, some answers uh, from them. We are recording this, so we, we know who you are. And uh, we will try to get uh, the answers uh, to them or, um, you know, our, our speakers here are, hopefully they are available. If you have any questions, contact them directly uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and they might be able to help. Um, Rex, do you have any, any final thoughts? Uh, just a couple of real quick things. In addition, in the chat, I noticed there was one message about uh, um, uh, an online session through AGU, I think, about energy and natural hazards that folks might want to take a look at and, and uh, check on that link. Uh, I, I do appreciate the number of questions here. I think we've had a ton of them that we couldn't get to. And I think, again, that just shows the ongoing level of interest. I'd also say that last question, the, the conversation about uh, uh, distance of, uh, we're, we're talking about distance and influence of disposal some of that crosses state lines. And I think that comes a little bit back to why risk was created was to sort of allow folks in different you know, across state lines to compare notes easily. So I think this, it's clearly a cross boundary issue, even if we can't figure out exactly how far of a cross boundary issue it is. And uh, so I think that answer sort of uh, is clear about both in terms of the issue that you all are dealing with as regulators and the, again, how we've tried to approach it uh, from the state survey perspective in the Southern Mid-Continent. With that, I think, uh, I, I just wanna thank all of you for hanging in there. I wanna thank everybody for their questions, particularly thank the panelists who agreed to do this. And Michael, I think I'll turn it back over to you if you wanna preview the next one of these webinars and where people can go to see the recording on the website. And with that, thank you all again. Michael? Yeah, thank you. And um, and, and so uh, just a couple words. I mean, uh, first of all, for those who are interested, um, the Groundwater Protection Council has just uh, released uh, um, the Induced Seismicity Guide. And there is a link in the chat box on where you can download this, um, um, this very comprehensive document on, on uh, you know, the advancements that have been occurring in induced seismicity over the last few years. A lot of the folks that are here um, today contributed to that. And uh, so thanks everybody for, for doing that. We're gonna try to, I would say, uh, sort of alternate between traditional webinars where people are, where, where you all are seeing all the time now and these kinds of more interactive panels. And, um, and so the next one is gonna be more of the traditional type. Uh, we don't have the speaker lined up yet, but we will soon and then we will send emails out. And then in August, we have a, uh, I believe that Kyle Murray from OGS will lead a panel on water management. And um, very similar to the format that we have here. And then uh, later in the year, we will have another panel on more, much more on the seismicity with seismologists from each of the different states. And so um, with that, I, I think I would like to think this is a success. We were able to try a new panel approach. If anybody has any comments on how we can do this better, I'm not gonna send out a survey. You know, we all do surveys are crazy and uh, this way, but if you have any thoughts, please just uh, send uh, Rex or I or Dina, um, just what your thoughts are on how this could be made better. Cause we really are trying to kind of optimize 
um, these interactions. Uh, you're spending an hour of your time with us. We'd like to make it worth your while. Um, and um, again, I'd like to thank Groundwater Protection Council, Department of Energy, uh, NETL, and the Fossil Energy Office for supporting this. Um, these are the kinds of interactions we want to try to uh, to have with uh, the, a variety of different folks in the community. And uh, with that, um, I wish everybody a great afternoon, and we will see you in a couple of months. Thanks again, and Rex, thanks for your help. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. <laughs>